turn that thing off. That's starting to become a habit, not turning my mic on. Well, um, good afternoon. And again, welcome to Calvary Chapel Northwest. Today we're continuing our study in the book of 1 Peter. Our text today is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. So if you will turn there with me, you can follow along as I read. It's interesting, today our topic of study as we approach this passage of scripture is about uh, trials. And yet, I stand before you just feeling so blessed, so blessed. You know, as I, as, as I looked up here at, at the men serving in, in our body, you know, and, and seeing God's work on each life, knowing that, that our worship leader, God called him from a place of uh, social anxiety and extreme shyness to stand in front and lead. Who, who didn't even have uh, any musical knowledge of an instrument, taught himself to play guitar. And now he's up here like, you know, like he's been doing it for years. You know, that's such a blessing in each and every man that God has touched, just knowing their stories, knowing their lives, and how God continues to work in each and every one. But I, I need to mention, if there's any ladies that want to be on a worship team, was all guys up here today, right? Our, our, our one female voice that was left, of course, she had to be home today uh, with, with sick children. But what is unique as well is I grew up in a church that was dominated by women. My, my, my father didn't go to church. My mother, my mother brought us to church. And there were many families like that where the the Church was dominated by women, and there were few men to stand up. And I'm so blessed that I belong to a church that has godly men, godly men willing to, to stand up, to lead their families and direct them in the, in the things of God. And, and that's such a blessing. That's a blessing. I look out, I see my beautiful wife. It's a blessing to have her by my side and, and my son is visiting me, a blessing to have him from Oregon. Uh, last week, I was, I was privileged and blessed and honored to watch his ordination via live stream as, as his church body recognized his calling and his gifting as a pastor of evangelism. Blessing, absolute blessing. And, and also to see, see my daughter serving back there in... Uh, audio visual and and my other daughter who who's normally up here in praise and worship and my daughter in san diego teaching sunday school at at calvary chapel oceanside they are just it's such a blessing when your children are walking with the lord you know it's, it's so I, I'm, I stand here blessed but yet our topic is is trials our, our topic is trials and, and that's okay because it's appropriate, as you all know. So please uh, read with me or follow along as I read. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? 
Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we come before you today, Lord, so grateful that we can gather as the body of Christ, as the family of God, and we can open your word. And Lord God, have your Holy Spirit speak through me as I surrender my heart and voice to you. Speak your words, Lord God, and that you, Holy Spirit, will minister to each and every heart that is open to you today. We pray, Lord, that you would have your way here and that, Lord God, if any that is in this sanctuary or listening online does not know you in a personal way, a real way, Lord, does not have a personal relationship with you, not just an acquaintance with you. We pray, Lord God, that you would bring that person into that relationship where they are born again and they know without the shadow of any doubt that they will be with you for all eternity. So God, direct this study, have your way, lead us, and be glorified in all that is said and done here. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our text starts, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Strange. Strange. I think that this following definition of the word strange is appropriate to our study today. When I looked up strange, this was a definition I got. Unusual or surprising in a way that is unsettling or hard to understand. If you've been following along as we have studied through the book of 1 Peter, you should definitely not find that um, this is unsettling or hard to understand because you know that Christians will undergo trials. If you do find this concept unusual, surprising, unsettling, or hard to understand, my prayer is that God the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart through his word today and we will clear up that confusion. You see, this concept is not uncommon in the Bible, and it's not uncommon in the book of 1 Peter, which we have been studying. I want you to look back at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. It says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter addresses trials in the very first chapter of this epistle. He goes on in chapter 2, 1 Peter 2, verses 20 through 21, and he says, for what credit is it? If when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Suffering for doing good is a trial, is it not? In, in verse 21, it says that we Believers were called to this, to follow Christ's example of suffering. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. So suffered. Suffering is addressed in, in each of the first three chapters of Peter. And even chapter 4, which we are in now, starts off in verse 1 and 2 saying this. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. So not only do these passages tell us that we will suffer through trials, they inform us that there is benefits in suffering through trials. Those benefits are both long-term, impacting our ultimate glorification, and immediate, impacting our continued sanctification. What you need to know is that God loves you. God is love. He does not allow you to suffer without cause and without great benefit. There is a purpose behind suffering. The first passage we read, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, tells us the reason for our suffering in verse 7. It says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, when genuine faith is tested by fiery trials, that faith becomes beautiful. And when Jesus returns, that faith will be shown to all how it resulted in the praise, honor, and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Long-term and short-term benefits. 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21 spoke of us receiving commendation from God for suffering and taking it patiently. Those commendations happen here and now, and also when we stand before God in heaven to receive our rewards. And then 1 Peter 3, 13 through 14 tells us when we suffer for righteousness, we are blessed and we don't need to be afraid when we are suffering. Suffering produces immediate blessings and develops that trust in our Lord and Savior that takes away all of our fear. We can stand strong. And 1 Peter 4, 1 through 2, it extols the immediate benefit that one suffering for Christ has now ceased from sin. In suffering for Christ, you don't live in the lust of your flesh. And we will talk more about that when I get to verse 14. Those four passages that we've already covered in earlier studies in, in, in 1 Peter, reveal the benefits here and now achieved by suffering for Jesus. Now, we need to put some cultural context here. The believers that Peter were writing to were undergoing great persecution that would only intensify. They were being persecuted not only by the Jews, their fellow countrymen, but they were also being persecuted by the Roman government. That persecution would intensify under Nero, and millions would lose their lives simply for their faith in Jesus. Nero was a man that was obviously possessed by Satan and a hater of all that was God. He believed himself as as the other Roman leaders did, that they were God, that they were the religion and they needed to be worshipped and any other worship would be against the law. This man would use Christians as torches to light the way into his, his palace. He, he would use Christians as entertainment as they would die in the Colosseum from lions. This was an ungodly man, and Peter is writing to those Christians that would be under this type of persecution. We know nothing about that type of persecution in this country. We've been blessed. But there are countries, even today, where it's illegal to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's illegal to be in possession of a Bible or even declare yourself as a Christian. You can be persecuted and even killed 
for proclaiming Jesus Christ. Peter is not talking about someone making fun of you because you profess Christ. We're talking about real loss, loss of property, loss of important aspects of your life, and even loss of your very life itself. And how are those believers told to respond? How are we told to respond should we be put in that situation? Verse 13 of our text. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Rejoice. Rejoice. How are we to rejoice? We rejoice because of identification with Christ. If, if you're identified with Jesus Christ, meaning you, you belong to him, you are his, you are actually and really born again. When his glory is revealed, I'm longing for that day when his glory is revealed. We just studied through the book of Revelation. We got to, to, to look at that glory being revealed. Yesterday, I was in Florida attending uh, my aunt's funeral, a, a godly woman, loved by her family and her community, a, a, a lover of Jesus. And, and as I was standing graveside, I was looking up. The sun was shining, but there were some clouds. And I, I was looking at those clouds, and I was talking to Jesus. I was saying, Lord, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see my aunt again. But if you want to make that time between that reunion a short one, you can go ahead on and bust open through those clouds right now and take us home. His glory will be revealed, and we can, we can rejoice in that. We'll be exceeding. It says, glad with exceeding joy. Knowing that is what allows us to, to go through being a partaker of Christ's suffering. But what does it actually mean to be a partaker of his suffering? Obviously, Jesus suffered physically at the hands of the Romans. He was beaten with, 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 with rods. He was beaten with a strap of, of metal and, and bone until his, his flesh hung off of him. A, a, a crown of thorns was platted upon his head and ultimately he was hung on a cross with nails going through his, his wrists and his feet. So we know that he suffered physically. But to be a partaker in Christ's suffering is not just about physical suffering, although that is certainly included. Like I said earlier, around the world, even today, Christians are being beaten. They're being tortured and even killed for their faith in, in Jesus. So physical suffering is obviously partaking in Christ's suffering. But there's more. Looking back to 1 Peter 2, 20 through 21, it says, For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, that is commendable before God. For to this you are called but because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Suffering for doing good is partaking in Christ's suffering. Suffering for doing good is what Jesus' life was all about when he walked on earth, right? All Jesus did was good. He was the sinless lamb of God. He, he never sinned, yet he was despised. Jesus was persecuted. He was constantly being questioned by those whose only objective was try to trap Jesus in his words and bring accusation against him. Jesus brought healing and wholeness to the masses, and yet he was murdered on a cross because of the good that he did. If you're doing good and you're suffering for it, you are partaking in the suffering of Christ. Look at verse 14 of our text. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, 
Blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. I said I would explain that suffering for Jesus gives us victory over sin. When I got to verse 14, I'm in verse 14. It's very important for us to understand this concept. The key here in verse 14 is reproached for the name of Christ. That is the key here. See, see, you could be doing good, you could be doing good works and, and suffering, but you're not suffering or being reproached for the name of Christ. That is the key. What's in a name? Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name above all names. What's in a name? Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What is in a name? You see, the name of Jesus represents his person. It represents the totality of who he is. Being reproached for the name of Christ is, is not being reproached just because you call yourself a Christian. It's being reproached because you are allowing Jesus to reproduce his life in you. You are walking in the power of his Holy Spirit. That is being reproached for the name of Jesus. You see, the name of Jesus isn't just a tagline. It's, it's not a magical formula that you just put on the end of your prayers to get answered. You know, I, know, I prayed, but now I got to say in the name of Jesus, right? It's not just a magical phrase. In the name of Jesus means you are, as Scripture says, if, if, if I abide in you, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, it's that abiding with God. It's being united with him and connected with him and allowing the Holy Spirit to reproduce his life through you. That is praying in the name of Jesus. That is living in the name of Jesus. And when you're being reproached because of that life, you are being reproached because of the name of Jesus. Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you are walking in the spirit, you are projecting the life of Jesus. When you are reproached because of that, that is what it means to be walking in the name of Jesus. We're living out of our identification with Jesus, walking in his name. And when that happens, you, you won't be sinning. So that is what our text says when it says that when you have suffered in the flesh, you have ceased from sin. Because suffering in the flesh is denying the flesh. It's allowing the Holy Spirit to produce the life of Christ in you. And according to Galatians 5.16, when you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's one or the other. You know, you're, you're surrendering yourself to the spirit of God or you're surrendering yourself to your flesh. And here's a promise for you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer 
persecution. It's part of it. It is part of it. You will suffer persecution. When we are reproached for the name of Christ, it's because we've identified with Christ and God's spirit is resting on us. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Those who oppose the work of God in you are in opposition to God himself. They will give an account unless under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they recognize their sin and surrender to Jesus. Either way, on the part of the believer, God is glorified as we bear the name of Christ. God is glorified because you are walking as a representative of Christ. You are displaying his life before the world, and it, it, it's like a magnet drawing the ire of the enemy drawing the opposition of those who are opposed to God. It, it, you will be persecuted for it. You won't be persecuted if you are a, um, I call them undercover Christian, right? You're an undercover Christian. You, you're a Christian. You believe in Christ, but nobody knows. You know, you're keeping it on the DL, you know? You're, you're, you're at the water cooler and, you know, all, all this Wicked conversation is going on and, and you're laughing and giggling right along with it. You know, you, you part of the crowd. No, don't live like that. Be a conspicuous Christian. You know, be, be a conspicuous Christian where people know. You know, when, 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 when you get to the water cooler, you know, you know the conversation changes. You know, it, it gets a little bit weird, right? The, the air gets a little bit thick, you know. Oh, oh there, there, there he is. There she is, you know. Uh, I, I don't want to cuss around, around them, you know. Why, why are you changing yourself for me? You know, change yourself for me, you know. Change yourself for Jesus, you know. Get really right, you know. Yeah, we, we need to represent God. On, on their part, he's blasphemed, but on, on our part, he is glorified. Verse 15 reminds us, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Peter has made this point before. We, we must not misrepresent Jesus Christ. If you are a believer and you murder someone, you can repent. God will forgive you but you're still going to jail, right? You will be a Christian in jail, and you're not there because you were persecuted for Jesus Christ. You're there because you murdered someone, right? So we need to understand that there is no, no benefit when we do wrong and, and we're persecuted. We're only benefited when we are persecuted for bearing reproach for the name of Jesus. Here's the contrast, verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. There is absolutely nothing to be ashamed of if you are bearing the name of Jesus Christ and the world is descending upon you. You know, we're, we're, we're living in in a dark time these days. You know, I, I was talking to my son, listening to him a little bit earlier, and, and God has called him to evangelism. So he's, he's out there, he's constantly talking with people. And, and it amazes me that, that he said that the younger generation, you know, 18, 19 years, I mean, I would, I would have never have thought about this. These people have never heard the gospel. You can mention Jesus to them, and they don't know who Jesus is. This is unbelievable. When I was growing up, you know, everybody, you know, knew, knew about Jesus. Everybody heard the gospel. You know, this is a Christian nation. It's no longer that way. You know, there, there, there are people coming up that 
have never heard the gospel. They've, they've never been confronted with, with who Jesus is. And as the Bible says, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. We don't realize how many people out there just haven't heard the gospel. They don't know how good Jesus is. You know, all they know is what they hear on TV. You know, all, all they know is what they see on, on, on the constant programming that comes from the God little G of this world. You know, television programming. That's the right word for it, right? Because that's exactly what they're doing. They're programming the minds of people to accept and believe in a worldview that is totally at opposition with what the word of God says. And, and they don't even know it, right? If, if they don't have the right information, if they're not presented with the truth, how can they know? And it's whose job to tell them the truth? It's our job. You know, wherever we are in whatever situation and circumstance we find ourselves, God has commissioned us to represent him, to show them who Jesus is. Verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Judgment. <clears throat> judgment is a word that carries a number of different connotations. Judgment can be punishment for wrongdoing. Right. When, when the sentence is imposed, you know, I sentence you to such and such. That is a judgment. Judgment could also mean just discerning where you're making a determination of whether something is right or wrong. John 7, 24 says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. That's, that's looking at things and, and examining it and making a determination. That is a type of judgment. Judgment is also an assessment of quality. 1 Corinthians 3.13 speaks of this when it says, Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. God's going to judge our works on that day of, of what quality it is, right? We, we do judgment when we, when we go to the produce center, right? And we're, we're squeezing them avocados, you know? Is it ripe? Is it too ripe? You know, we're making the judgment, which is a good one, which is, is, is not a good one. Our text says judgment will begin at the house of God. Why at the house of God? Because God has high standards. We know that God has high standards. As a matter of fact, God's standard for entering heaven is perfection. If you're listening to me online and, and, and you are under the impression that you are going to heaven because you are, are a good person, you are, are a pretty good guy, you do more good than bad, I got some bad news for you. God's standard is perfection. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever done anything that was wrong? If you have, you missed the mark. And you will not go to heaven. God's standard is perfection. That is why only our Lord Jesus Christ could purchase our salvation and why the only way to attain salvation is by receiving the gift. It's a gift, not of works, the Bible tells us. Jesus gives us the gift because he is the only one that met God's perfect standard. And we receive salvation by a gift. There was absolutely nothing we could do to appease a perfect and holy God in our sinful state. And although God has provided us with this great salvation, our lives don't end there. That is where our lives begin. 
having received God's spirit, having obtained eternal salvation, we are now even more obligated to pursue God's standard for living. And God's standard for living is this. Be holy, for I am holy. So God's judgment, which is not punishment in this case, is scrutiny. God's judgment begins at God's own house with his own people. God has called us to live righteously. Once we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and are born again, we are expected to grow into maturity. We are expected to grow in faith, grow in holiness. And if it begins with us first, our text says, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? First of all, what does it mean to obey the gospel of God? The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. To obey the gospel of God means to acknowledge that you are a sinner, to acknowledge that you are a lost, to acknowledge that Jesus' blood shed on Calvary's cross is the only way to enter into God's kingdom, to receive Jesus as Lord. That is obeying the gospel of God. If you don't obey the gospel of God, it says, what will be the end? Verse 18. Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the righteous one scarcely saved, Right. I mean, do you remember that day that you came into a relationship with Jesus Christ and was born again? You know, you you received him. You, you surrendered. To, finally. Right. After God was calling you, you know, so many opportunities and times you, you went your own way. You know, you did this. If you were like me, man, I had a lot of close calls in my life before I got saved. You know, I, I, I could have lost my life. A number of times, you know, I, I almost got ran over by a car, you know, my bike got hit, but I, I managed to survive. I was in a number of, of gang fights and, and, and shootouts and, you know, just I could have been taken out, you know. But I was scarcely saved, you know, that that day came and I accepted, you know, now I'm safe. I'm good. Eternity is mine. But, but so many others are on that side, and they keep saying, later, later, later. Let, you know, let, 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 let me live my life first. Let, let me enjoy the things of this world first. If the righteous one is scarce to say, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? We know the answer to that question, don't we? We know where they will appear. We, we just study Revelation. Let's read a verse from Revelation. 21, Revelation 21, verse 27. Talking of God's kingdom, his heaven, the place of glory, it says, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defies or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Hebrews 2, verse 3 says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard? It? How shall we escape? We can't. There is no escape. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. You see, we fall on one side. We either belong to Jesus, we're walking with Jesus, and we're, we're, we're going to experience suffering and persecution, or we're outside of Christ. We're outside of him, and the end of those is Eternal separation from God. So there's no doubt about it. Christians have been called to participate in the sufferings 
of Christ to the glory of God. Now, there are some churches that proclaim a false doctrine that you have the power by your faith to rebuke all bad things out of your life. You know, you, you, you can send away sickness. You can send away anything that you don't like. You can get rid of it by your faith. And, and, and if you can't do that, it's because your faith isn't strong enough. That's not scriptural. That's not scriptural. If you belong to Jesus Christ, it is God's will for you to participate in the suffering of Christ. Now, I, I'm very thankful that our lives have tremendous blessings. We're, we're, we're not always in trials. We're, we're not always experiencing suffering, and, and thank God for that. You know, it seems like the majority of the time we're just experiencing the tremendous blessings of God. But we must always have the mind of Christ and be prepared for when those fiery trials come. Because they are coming, right? Our, our, our text says, don't think it's strange about the fiery trials that you will experience. They're coming. You know, not, not that you might happen. They are coming. So we must have that mind of Christ to be ready. Be thankful when God is just lavishing his blessings on you. Oh, man, it's, it, it, it's so good. I love it, man. I love it. But we got to be ready. And don't think it's strange. You know, oh, oh man, what's going on here? There's persecution. I'm What? A trial, it's not strange. It's expected. It's going to come, you know? I mean, I, I, it's been said that for the Christian, you are either in a trial, you've just got out of a trial, or you're on your way into a trial, right? That's where you're living, you know? Thank God for that, 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 that time where we're out of a trial. You know, let it be a long span before we head back into another trial. But we, we experience these things, and they're part of life, and we can't think it's strange. So I want to encourage you in closing with this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. It says this, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This is the mindset that, that we need to have. I know that when you're in that trial, it doesn't seem like a, a light affliction. And it doesn't seem like it's only for a moment. But if you look at it with God's perspective, if you look at the eternal instead of the, the temporal, it says while we look at those things which are unseen, right? Remember the case when, when Peter asked Jesus to allow him to step out of the boat? and walk on the water, a oh, tremendous act of faith. How many would have that kind of faith? You know what I mean? Man, Jesus, you walking on water, let me do it too. That was a tremendous act of faith. And he got out of there, and then the word says he, he, he started looking at, at, the, at the waves. He started looking at how boisterous it was, and he began to sink, right? He, he took his eyes off of Jesus. When we're going through these trials, don't look at the trial. Look at Jesus and understand that there is a far exceeding weight of glory. God has a purpose for you in going through those trials, and you will see it. You will see it. You are, you are gaining crowns in heaven just by being patient and trusting God. Your spiritual muscles are being developed to trust him more, trust him more, and trust him more. This life, James 4.14 says, is just a vapor. 
It appears for a second, and then it's gone. My example is always, you know, you take that hot skillet, and then you take some water, and you just throw a little bit of water on it, and what do you see? Psst. That's it. That is our life compared to eternity. We can endure. We can endure the trials because we know that God has a purpose for them, and it's simply to draw us closer to him. It's simply to make us more powerful in our walk for him and to bring glory to him. Let's pray. Gracious God and Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we understand as your body that there are times that will we'll try us, that we will have to undergo intense periods of, of pain and heartache and hardship. But gracious God, as we keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord, we know that we can receive from you strength through those hard times as long as God we are truly connected to you and God that is my prayer right now as I close Lord I want to give the opportunity for anyone listening to my voice God that does not know you in that personal way they may have an acquaintance with you they may know about you but maybe they have never known you, dear God, in such a way to experience the new birth. Their life has never been changed. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. If you're listening to my voice and that has never happened to you, you've never had that experience, I want to give you the opportunity right now to receive Jesus as your Lord, to surrender your life to him completely. You see, if he's not the Lord of all, he's not the Lord at all. You need to surrender yourself to him and be born again. If that's you, if you're here in the sanctuary and you need to receive the Lord, please raise your hand and I'll pray with you. If you're listening online and you want to receive the Lord, God sees your heart. Just from the heart, pray something simple, like, gracious Lord Jesus, I know that I've lived my life on my own terms, and I may have known about you, Lord, but your spirit is pressing on my heart, letting me know that I don't have the relationship with you that I should have, and I want to surrender my heart to you completely right now i want you to fill me with your holy spirit dear god drive me to your word that i can open it and behold the wondrous things from your law and find out how i'm supposed to live how i'm supposed to walk with you in righteousness and holiness if you've prayed that prayer god has received you to himself and you will know as he and dwells you and fills you with his spirit. Saints of God, we understand what Peter is saying. We're not to think it's strange concerning that fiery trial, but we are to live our lives completely and totally for the Lord. And as we do, we will experience such great blessings in him. We thank you for that, Heavenly Father. Lord, going through trials with you is better than living a life of excess and, and all of the things that the world can give us. It, it's so much greater, God, because of the peace in our heart, the peace that passes understanding. So we thank you and we glorify you. Gracious God, so good. Dismiss us, dear God, in your presence as we praise and worship you one final time today. In your holy name, thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Uh, please join us on Wednesday as we start our book in the study of Revelation. I'll be Genesis. Revelation is the end. Genesis is the beginning. Genesis.